Hello and welcome to Essex by the Sea. I'm Owen Ward exploring the Essex coast, finding out about the amazing and interesting stories it has to offer. Across Essex's 350 mile long coastline, salt marshes are a distinctive feature. And along the River Blackwater and the estuary of the river, the salt marsh is over 35,000 years old. However, the Essex Wildlife Trust say 100 hectares of salt marsh are being lost around the UK every year. Uh, Lauren Cosson is from the Trust and joins me for this episode of Essex by the Sea. Hello Lauren, thank you very much for inviting me along to the Essex Wildlife Trust headquarters. Hi Owen, it's lovely to have you here at Abbott's Hall. You've taken me on quite a walk from the buildings and we are right on the edge of the River Blackwater. There's, there's water just in front of me and, and this is the salt marsh isn't it? This is a 20-year salt marsh, so unlike the 35,000-year-old salt marsh that you were talking about, this is a relatively new example of what salt marsh can look like. And it was the Essex Wildlife Trust that that reinstated this 20 years ago. Why, first of all? Well, when Essex Wildlife Trust got Abbott's Hall in 1999, they also inherited quite a long medieval sea wall and the trouble was that was quite weathered, as you can imagine, over hundreds and hundreds of years and it can be quite costly to repair something like that. And at the, at the t- same time, salt marsh is really seriously under threat because the trouble is rising seawater and a sea wall squashes salt marsh, so then it disappears. So when our trust team got Abbott's Hall, they thought this is quite a good opportunity to perhaps try out a project that isn't really done and manage realignment is that project. And so what that means is you either remove or reinstate a sea wall closer inwards so that you give salt marsh a bit of a chance to grow. For those that don't know, can you explain what a salt marsh actually is? I mean, is it salty? <laughs> it definitely is salty because it's the water from the rivers, the sea, and what it is is grassland or fields that get exposed to the seawater. So you can imagine the water that washes upon them and then it creates that muddy, marshy, moody look that you might know from Essex. Looking out as we are across the River Blackwater, I can see the remains of the nuclear power station at Bradwell uh, just in front of us. Over towards our left, I'm presuming that's Mersey Island, I think. Yes, if my geography is correct, I can see the red and white uh, boat uh, that is the Ross Revenge belonging to Radio Caroline. And sort of the the river stretches around, obviously, up towards uh, towards Malden. But it's this stretch here, and, and you can see the banks that, as you say, with the seawall just out stretching out into the distance. So they were breached to allow the seawall to, to to come into to the edge where we're now standing. Exactly. So what happened was in 2002, so 20 years ago, this autumn, the seawall was breached in a number of places, and that meant that the water was able to flood back in the Blackwater estuary was welcomed back onto these fields that were previously arable farming fields and um, quite quite soon after that the the vegetation started to grow and, and there's these special plants that are able to withstand really salty conditions which a lot wouldn't be able to hack from the sea and those plants are really special because what they do is they absorb carbon and they also attract insects which attracts the birds which attracts the mammals so you've got you know wildlife coming back as well as it being a storage for carbon we'll come on to the carbon in a moment but let me just talk about the wildlife because there is a a whole variety of birds predominantly that we can see from our vantage point here the tide is in so there's not a lot of land Uh, i'm guessing the ones that like to to sort of wade around in the mud looking for for food have, have gone elsewhere temporarily but they'll be back won't they Definitely. So with the tides, the the water will come in and it will come out. And when it goes out, what you'll see is if you are imagining an aerial view of the salt marsh, it almost looks like kind of a a pathway of of, of a brain and and all veins because it's like these little banks and and nooks and crannies that mean that there's muddy sort of wading areas for the birds to splash around and nibble those insects. But there's also deeper pools of water for fish. We see fish here, so there's there's a lot for wildlife here. As we was walking down, talking of fish, I did see a heron take off uh, as we were, were walking down the, the path. And there's quite large flocks as we arrived. There was a large flock of, of white birds, I'm afraid. I don't know what, what those birds were. Maybe you could, could tell me. But I'm guessing this is a, a very important place, particularly for those birds that migrate. Definitely. So it changes. Yeah, exactly. So salt marsh is good all through the year, but especially in these kind of autumn, winter months where the water's here because you've got transatlantic birds like 
dark-bellied Brent geese that we see here in Essex, and they they'll use the salt marsh to look for food and recover before they, you know, travel all those miles back to their breeding grounds in Russia. So um, you could have widgeon, shoveler, those those wading ducks that you say, and heron. We also get birds of prey. You might see marsh harriers swooping up above quite high. You'll know they're there because the other birds know they're there. So that's quite a good telltale sign. But also. The fish, last year we did a survey to see how the marine life was faring and you might be surprised that there was 14 species of fish found in our new salt marsh, so that's quite an impressive number, I think. And that's been established just within the last 20 years, so the bit of salt marsh a bit further along the river coastline here that's even older, presumably there will be more established uh, species and and, and a home for, for other things that haven't arrived here yet, perhaps. Yeah, so we're constantly monitoring this salt marsh and our team, our ecological team, will come out and just check and, and survey species because, like you say, we're hoping that eventually more wildlife will find their way here and call this home just as much as they call the other salt marsh home. You mentioned about it capturing carbon. I mean, how how does that do that then? And, and what impact does that have on the greater environment, not, not just the locality here on the edge of the Blackwater? Well, as we know... Obviously, we're facing a climate crisis at the moment, so anything in our environment which helps us to prevent some of that damage is is massively important for the trust and for everyone. So salt marsh is what we call a nature-based solution, and that's something in the environment which is providing us with an answer to the climate problems. So when I say it's a carbon sink, what I mean is the plants that are on the salt marsh, because they withstand those salty conditions, what they do is they're absorbing carbon all the time, the same as trees in the rainforest. And because of the muddy conditions, what they end up doing is they get squashed down, compacted into the salt marsh for years and years and years. Instead of releasing the carbon back into the environment, it could stay there for hundreds and hundreds of years. So that's what we mean in terms of the carbon absorption. It's silent almost. I can just about hear the birds tweeting in the background. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit breezy. The sun's about to break through the clouds as we look out across this very vast area. I, th- I, I think I read, and, and please correct me, Lauren, if I'm wrong, in that this was actually the largest project of its kind at the time. At the time, this was a really ambitious project. So the project meant that 50 hectares of new salt marsh was going to be created. And, you know, we're thankful that we had this opportunity because other conservationists and and other organisations can hopefully use our managed realignment as an example, as a case study for this to happen in other places. We have done this at another site at Fingering Howick Nature Discovery Park. We've got um, a managed realignment there, so more salt marsh and more wildlife. So we're starting to, you know, carry on this project in other sites and hopefully this case study can be used worldwide. What sort of impact then does re-establishing the salt marsh here have on the the wider estuary? I mean does it naturally if you create it birds and wildlife come or or does that need a bit of work? The good thing about salt marsh and managed realignment is that actually it requires little work and of course we're managing it to make sure that it's beneficial for wildlife but really we've got to let nature do its thing and and that's the important thing instead of spending hundreds of pounds restoring sea walls and and spending money on that when it could be spent elsewhere we're letting salt marsh be it's resilient it it can adapt and that's what's really great about it and for those coastal communities like you're saying on the outskirts here this is now a climate defense for them against sea rise a coastal barrier if you like that isn't man-made and it's not costly for them. And I guess, I mean, looking at the sort of gentle ripples in the water that's predominantly being made by the the wind today, I would imagine, actually, you know, when there is a bit of of rough water out in in the river estuary and and sort of around our coast, it it does provide that natural defence, that natural barrier, and, and ultimately then does slow coastal erosion. Exactly. So those muddy banks that you're seeing, all those nooks and crannies, they're little mini barriers, they're nature's barriers. Instead of a man-made wall, they're just mud walls created by the environment and that's exactly what happens so as you see here apart from the wind there's not much movement and that's why it's perfect for wildlife because they're able to feed rest here where there's not sort of tidal surges and chaos out in the crazy estuary (laughs) clearly uh this project has has been a success i can see a a white bird down there don't know what that is could be a heron possibly there's one there where 
There, can you see it flying across? No, that's perfectly white. I think of herons being grey. Well, you have grey herons and white herons. <laughs> so a bit of both. You, can, you might see their, the grey herons with their underside being grey and, and kind of little bits of flecks of black in their hair. That's what maybe what you're thinking of. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. The ones that would sort of sit at the side of your pond, <laughs> eating your fish, uh, perhaps. Um, actually, I saw one actually on the on the roof of my neighbour's house the other day. It was very strange. You're not going to catch a fish at, on top of a roof. But anyway, um, I, th- there's so much wildlife here. Clearly, this has been a, a success over, over 20 years, but presumably it doesn't stop here. It doesn't stop here. Like I said, there's not much management involved from us apart from keeping an eye on it and hoping that wildlife does recover here. But... We're looking forward to seeing how the next 10, 20, 50 years, we've just celebrated two decades, but it would be lovely to see a century on how well adapted and how much wildlife is really coming to life here. So it's something for the Trust to to hopefully celebrate in those years. What do you think that will be like if we were stood here 50 years time, say, um, uh, doing another episode of Essex by the Sea? You never know. We might still be going then. What do you think this landscape will look like? Will it look much changed from what it is now? Or do you think it will mature and develop over those years? I would expect to see, depending on what time of year you're here, for example, in the summer, you've got um, bright pockets of sea lavender and samphire that's bright green. So if we, imagine we're here in the summer in, in all those decades' time. I think I'd see a lot of colour, a lot of life, a lot of birds... I know we have quite a lot at the moment, but I really hope that it would be advanced and, like you say, more species, better biodiversity and just a really resilient habitat that can hopefully provide life for decades, centuries to come. Lauren, thank you so much for inviting me here to the headquarters of of the Essex Wildlife Trust and uh, for for bringing me down onto the salt marsh, which uh, on a day like today, as the sun is now shining through and, and reflecting off the water, looks absolutely stunning. It's absolutely a pleasure to have you. Don't forget, you can follow Essex by the Sea on TikTok, Twitter. You can also subscribe on YouTube and like on Facebook and Instagram. Plus, check out my Ko-fi page where you can leave a little donation if you'd like to. So, uh, until next time, thanks very much for listening.